All right. Well, hello, museum families, and welcome to RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions, and there are about 30 of them, are recorded, and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. My name is Chris O'Connor, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I'm an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. So one of my jobs here at the museum is that I run the kids and families and schools program, uh, programs. Um, so when it's not a pandemic, I'm around a lot of kids and it's my favorite part of working here. Some of the most insightful, caring, thoughtful, and action-oriented ideas have come from kids, not adults. Sorry, adults. Uh, I am constantly inspired by the passion and creativity of kids of all ages here at the museum, wanting to do good for each other and for their community. And books can be really helpful for kids to learn about issues and also learn about creating action around issues. So I wanted to invite on an author who creates books that does exactly this. Um, so really happy to have Robin Stevenson here today. Um, but before I introduce Robin, um, I wanted to go back to last week. Um, and just share what we did last week. So I'll pull that up. We have a new um, system here around showing PowerPoints. So just want to make sure that it can be seen. Uh, can it be seen? I'm Kim, can you? In your presenter view. Yeah, okay. Great. So RBC at Home Kids. Last week, so this week and last week, um, we're, we always love having authors on. So we had another author last week and a photographer, Isabel Grock. Um, and we learned all about sea otters and how, in, uh, how adorable they are. <laughs> I think I already knew that, but then I like even more so last week, uh, learning all about sea otters and did a little story time around sea otters and, and her new book. So um, usually we make some art, but we're, we didn't last week. Um, and this week we might do something like that, but um, you could always share your ideas with me directly at coconnor at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca or through our social media channels at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCMKids. Continue exploring after these sessions with our learning portal. There's lots of great content um, to explore um, that's connected to the museum and some of the ideas of the museum. So learning portal, uh, you could just Google that or rbcm at rbcm.ca slash LP. And then next week, we're joined by the Pacific Opera of Victoria, Make Some Noise. So it's going to be like a, a music lesson. Um, so we'll be doing some singing, maybe a little bit of dancing as two too. So that's uh, with our friends from Pacific Opera uh, next week. So I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen. And so in this uh, format, if you haven't joined us before, in this format, uh, you can see me, uh, your host, and our special guest. Today, that's Robin. <laughs> and um, but we can't see you, but we can hear from you if you use the chat um, on Zoom or the comments section on Facebook Live. Uh, so please ask questions as we go, go along. If you wanna practice like using your fingers right now, maybe write into the chat or the comments section, the book that you're currently reading or that you just finished reading. Um, if, you, if you feel like you'd like to, to share that. All right, so let's meet our special guest today. So Robin Stevenson is an award-winning author of more than 25 books for kids and teens. Her books have been translated into a number of languages, published in more than 10 countries, and has won or been nominated for numerous awards, including most recently the Sheila A. Egoff Children's Literature Prize for her book, My Body, My Choice. Some of her books include Pride, The Celebration and the Struggle, Kid Activists, True Tales of Childhood from Champions of Change, 
and Ghost Journey, a refugee story. The Royal BC Museum gift shop is selling some of Robin's books right now, thanks to Orca Book Publisher. So you can come down and buy a book from us here at the museum, we'd love to see you, um, or from your local bookstore. Um, so without further ado, welcome Robin, we're so glad, glad that you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I miss opportunities over the last little while to get out and talk to groups of kids in schools. So the opportunity to do this now online um, is a treat. So thank you for having me here. Uh -huh. So your typical school year would in involve, you were saying earlier that would involve going to different communities and visiting lots of different schools and classrooms? Exactly, yes, yeah. And generally like grade four to eight? But yeah, that, mostly yeah. upper elementary and middle school. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a, a note from a kid saying that they've, you've inspired them to write or that they like from what you, they read of you or, or heard you when you came to visit that inspired them? To, yeah, absolutely. I, I love hearing from young writers and I get lots of questions from young writers wanting um, to share what they're doing or to ask for writing advice or you know what happens if you sort of get stuck in the middle or do you ever get stuck in the middle of a book you're working on and it would, always is the answer right. yes every <laughs> single time yes right, right. Um, uh, but yeah I, I love hearing from readers um, whether it's questions about my books or about their own writing um, it's definitely one of the things that I didn't know about being an author and one of the sort of unexpected bonuses of, right. of children yeah Right. And I imagine for educators as well, it's really great to have uh, your books to help support maybe the teaching that they're doing within the classroom as just to, to extend some of the ideas that they're, they're maybe already working with. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I think, you know, books are such a great resource, really whatever topic you're learning about. And so um, to be able to, you know, make those connections um, between you know your own experience and the classroom and what you're reading and you know stories from history or stories from around the world, I think it's just so many um, books are such great jumping off points for so many conversations and for so much learning. Great. Well, I I have lots of questions, but I know that you're um, you'll you'll show us some some images uh, to begin with, and then uh, a good portion of the session will be hearing about some of your your books yeah. and story times. So, yeah, exactly. and I, I'm curious of how you began as a writer, but I know that's one of the first images that looks like it's your, it's you as a kid. So yes. I think yeah. you'll talk about that. Yeah. So shall I go ahead and screen share? Sure. All right. So these are my books. I've written, I think, 29 books for kids and teens, and they range from books for really young kids like Pride Colors, which is a board book for, for babies and toddlers, um, right up through picture books, early chapter books, middle grade novels, nonfiction and fiction, and books for teenagers as well. Um, so I write for a bunch of different age groups and, and different types of books. And the ones that I'm going to talk about a little bit today are Pride, The Celebration and the Struggle, Kid Activists, which is a nonfiction book about the childhood stories of a number of different activists and people who work for change in the world. And Ghost's Journey, which is the one with the cat on the cover down in the bottom corner. And those three all kind of connect to the topic of human rights, um, LGBTQ plus rights, refugee issues, activism, and how we make change when there's a topic that we really care about, you know, what kinds of things can we do to make a difference. And I'm going to start by and, talking a little and bit. And I noticed the book on the top right hand corner, Pride Puppy, is that yeah. one that is uh, going to be coming out but is not out yet? Yeah, so Pride Puppy comes out in the spring of 2021, um, as does When You Get the Chance, which is down beside Ghost's Journey at the bottom with the pink cover with the car on it. That one's a, a novel for teenagers that I wrote with my friend Tom Ryan, um, which is really fun. If, if, if any of you listening have tried writing with a friend, I highly recommend co-writing. I've done two novels now where I've worked with a friend and we take turns to write a chapter. Um, and it's a really fun way to write. So I definitely encourage people to try that out. Like that. And then Kid Innovators, which is down beside Kid Activists, that one also comes out in the spring. And that's childhood stories of 
inventors and entrepreneurs and um, it was a lot of fun to research and write. Yeah. So the next slide here, um, why is that not working? Oh, we practiced this and everything. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. So people often ask how I got started as a writer and really the answer is by reading a lot. I was a real bookworm as a kid. I, I just read all the time. I used to read a book while I was walking to school and then I would sit in class with a book under my desk reading a novel um, when we were supposed to be doing math or science or whatever. I just pretty much wanted to read all the time. And we moved around a lot. I was born in England and we moved to a bunch of different places in England and to Northern BC and to Japan and back to England and to Ontario and to Australia. And so I changed schools a lot and I was uh, often the, the new kid and I was a pretty shy kid anyway. So books were a really big, important part of my life. I love that picture up in the top corner because it looks like I started writing when I was really, really young. But in fact, I think I'm probably just, um, vandalizing a magazine or something. So I, I didn't- That's, start that's how it always starts. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I didn't start writing seriously till I was in my 30s um, after my son was born and I was on parental leave. And it was something I'd always wanted to do. So I just started keeping a notebook under his stroller and I would walk around Victoria and whenever he fell asleep, I would just sit down wherever we were and I would write in this notebook. And it just started, um, kind of growing into a story and I thought you know maybe this could be a children's book and um, by the time my son was three my first book came out and he's 16 now and I just have never stopped writing so um, it was an unexpected career change but one that I'm very very happy about but I think so, really you know I didn't study writing I really learned to write by reading. So Robin when you were that age on the beach there yeah. what do you if you can remember back to one book that you particularly loved. Yeah, uh, you, um, I loved fun? Harriet the Spy. Mm -hmm. Harriet the Spy was one of my favorites. I loved A Wrinkle in Time as well. Um, and I loved Lucy Maud Montgomery's book. So she wrote Anne of Green Gables, but she also wrote another series called Emily of New Moon. Mm -hmm. And I really love those books. And they're actually about a girl who wants to be a writer. Um, and those were really important. But I also, you know, I read fantasy, science fiction. Um, I read books about horses. I read lots of books that were set in boarding schools in England. I, I really pretty much devoured every book I could get my hands on. Yeah. Right. So my book Pride, The Celebration and the Struggle came out in March. And it's the second edition of a book, an earlier book that I wrote, um, Expanded. So it's quite a lot longer. It's got a lot of new stories and information in it um, and some wonderful photographs. And I wanted to show you some images from the book. Um, but it's about Pride Day and it's also about Pride as a concept. So Pride as both a celebration for the LGBTQ plus community and also as um, the ongoing struggle, the ongoing fight for equal rights for people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, um, queer, two-spirit. And when I talk about this book with people, one of the ways I like to begin is by talking about how Pride itself began, because it's a really interesting history and it's a history that a lot of people aren't aware of. And if you go to a Pride celebration, or if you've seen pictures of a Pride celebration, it really kind of looks like a big party, right? People are dressed up, there's music, there's balloons, people are having a good time. Um, but it is it's not just a celebration. It is also a protest. And it actually began with a riot. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that story of how it began. Actually, Robin, just before you begin, um, you used lots of letters. Yes. <laughs> Um, do, you, do you mind, just in case, uh, just in case anyone is, hears those letters and not sure what those letters mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I talked about the LGBTQ plus community. And what that stands for is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Lesbian meaning women who are primarily um, attracted to other women or girls who like other girls bisexual, meaning people who are attracted to people of more than one gender, um, 
gay, meaning uh, men who are attracted to other men, boys who like other boys. Also, we sometimes use gay as like a big umbrella term, like we'll talk about gay history or the gay community, kind of including everybody, but it can also use, be used specifically to talk about gay men. Um, transgender. Um, which is again a big umbrella term that includes people who might have a, a non-binary identity, who don't feel that they're either male or female, or people who were, when they were born, thought to be male, but as they get older, so you know, actually I don't really feel like a boy, I've always felt like a girl, um, and so they may transition from one gender to another. And then queer, Q, is again another big umbrella term that kind of tries to include everybody. Um, it's a word that I like and I do identify as queer myself. Some people don't like it. And so I think the important thing is, you know, if you have a friend who's part of the community, just to use the words that they're comfortable with and they feel like are a good fit for them. Because, you know, when we're talking about gender identity and how people feel about their own gender or who people fall in love with and want to be with, um, you know, those are really personal things. So it's just important to use language that the person themselves feels comfortable with and that feels like a good fit for them. And, and recognizing that language is always changing and evolving as well. So, yeah. And then two-spirit. Well, and two-spirit, yes. Meaning um, is a term that some Indigenous people who are part of the community use. And it's interesting because actually a lot of Indigenous languages had their own more specific terms to refer to people in their community who fell outside sort of traditional um, gender, gender roles. And some of those terms have been lost, but there's also some really interesting work being done to try to reclaim some of those um, older words as well. But, um, but two-spirit is one that is used by many indigenous people in the community. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, um, for asking. So back in the 1950s, 1960s, Life in Canada and the US for people who were gay or lesbian or bi or transgender was really difficult. And sometimes when I visit schools, I'll ask kids, you know, what do you, what do you guys know about what, what it was like back then? What do you think it was like back then? And they'll often say, you know, it was probably really hard and people probably couldn't really tell anybody. Um, or they'll say, you know, you, back then you couldn't get married. Um, and that's true, that's all true. But what people often don't know is that it was actually illegal so people could actually be arrested. Um, and it made it very difficult for people to, to be out. Um, and it made it difficult for people to find each other and form community. Um, and so the places where people could get together um, and meet were really important. And New York City had quite a large gay community back in the 1960s. But there was actually a local bylaw, a law, which said it was illegal for restaurants or bars to serve customers who were gay. So that made it hard for people to, to get together. And there were a few places where people could meet, um, gay bars that operated despite the law. And one of those was a bar called the Stonewall Inn, which was in Greenwich Village in New York City. And that was a place where people could get together for a drink, um, where two men could dance together, um, where a woman could hold hands with her girlfriend and, and be safe. But it wasn't all that safe because every so often the police would show up and harass people and arrest people and take them away in police cars. And back then, if you were arrested for being in a gay bar, your name could be published in the newspaper. Your family might find out and might reject you. You could lose your job. Your landlord could kick, kick you out of your apartment. There was no protection from discrimination. So um, it was a really scary time for a lot of people. And I think the fact that people did find each other and, and did go to places like the Stonewall Inn really speaks to how much we need community and how important community is. So one night in 1969, June 1969, the police showed up at the Stonewall Inn and started arresting customers. But that night something happened that was a little bit different. The customers started to fight back against the police. They started shouting at them, throwing things, telling them to, to leave the people alone. And a crowd began gathering outside. And as word began spreading in the city that the customers down at the Stonewall Inn were, were standing up to the police and fighting back, more people came down and joined in and a full on riot broke out. Now, some people were arrested, some people were hurt, but the rioting went on until three o'clock in the morning and the next night and a third night, riots broke out again. 
And during that time, people started to, to, to see some energy and some momentum and, and realize that, okay, people are fighting back now. And they started to form new organizations like the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activist Alliance to talk about how can we come together and how can we work for change and how can we fight for our rights. And about a month after the riots, they organized the first big protest for gay rights. And a year after the riots, they organized what they called Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day. And Christopher Street was the name of the street where the Stonewall Inn was. And they held a march through the streets of New York City. And this is the event that historians will point to and say this was the first Pride Parade. And this is why our Pride Parades now are um, at the end of June, most often, in recognition of the importance of this date. Um, so that's a photo from that, from 1970, from that very first um, Pride March. And since then, Pride parades have happened every year, um, gradually spreading across the straight states, North America, Europe, and around the world. And these days we're seeing many more small communities start to have Pride Days as well. So people don't have to travel to big cities to take part in a Pride celebration. So we've come a last, really long way in 50 years. Last summer, my kid and I went to New York City and went to Stonewall. Um, and because it was the 50th anniversary, oh, it was yes. all like, um, there is, uh, it looked really great and it just, it felt really powerful just to stand in front of this really important uh, institution. So. I am so jealous, Chris. I've never actually been, and mm. I so want to go. I would actually have been going in June, um, but of course the pandemic canceled uh, uh, travel plans, so I have yet to actually see it in person. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, there's a, a, a monument right across the, yeah, the, right across the street. Mm -hmm. with some statues of some of the people um, who, who were there that, at the Stonewall riots mm -hmm. um, and it's been declared a sort of historical site so it's a protected site now because it is such an important historical place. Mm -hmm. Oh that's really neat that you got to see it. So one of the groups that was a really big part of that fight for change 50 years ago and today as well were young people. So those organizations like the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activists Alliance, many of the people who joined those organizations were, were students, um, people in their teens, in their early 20s. And we're still seeing that today, that many young people are on the front lines of all social justice movements, right? Not just um, LGBTQ plus rights, but if we look at something like environmental issues and we see people like um, Autumn Pelche or Greta Thunberg, who are still in their teens, you know, who are such powerful voices for change. Um, so young people are a, um, a powerful force. And also the Black Lives Matter movement, there's uh, really driven by, by youth voices too. Yes, absolutely, yeah. One of the young people that I wrote about in my Pride book was True Wilson. And one of the highlights of, of writing this book for me was getting to speak to so many young people about, the, about their activism, about the work they were doing to make change. Now, True, this is true with her family in this picture. And she's the girl right behind her dad's head wearing the um, white and pink and blue lipstick in the colors of the trans Pride flag. And in this photo, her family are grand marshals at Vancouver's Pride Parade. Mm -hmm. Now, True um, is a girl who challenged her school system. So when True was about nine, she socially transitioned and began. She, she was assigned male when she was born. She, her family thought she was a boy. As she got older, she, she was very clear that she didn't feel like a boy and that, that she felt like a girl and wanted to live as a girl. And her parents were very supportive. But when they went to her school to let the school know that True would be using a girl's name and using she, her pronouns and wanting to wear the girl's uniform, the school wasn't supportive. Um, and so True and her family lodged a human rights complaint. And the work that they did and their activism led to a new policy in uh, the Vancouver separate school system so that hopefully children who come along after her who transition, who are transgender, um, and are attending those schools will be more supported um, and that there will be more 
understanding and support for them. And True's a very powerful young activist. Um, she wants to be a filmmaker someday. You can find her TEDx talk on YouTube where she tells her own story and, and talks about living her truth and that that's where she gets her, her power from. And she's a very um, articulate and inspiring speaker. And I look forward to seeing what she's going to do over the next few years, as with many of the young activists who are in this, this Pride book. Another of the young people whose story is included in my Pride book is, is Zoe. Zoe is a teenager from Illinois. And Zoe got involved with her high school's GSA. The GSA is a Gender and Sexuality Alliance or a Gay Straight Alliance. And these are school clubs that work to make their um, school environment safer and more inclusive and, and more supportive for students who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or two-spirit. Um, and Zoe says, I would say if a student is considering joining or starting a GSA, just go for it. I think all schools should have a GSA because it's important for everyone to have a place to go for support and friendship. And more and more schools are starting GSAs. They have a long history that goes right back to the early 1970s. A group of students of color at George Washington High started a club in their high school way back in the early 70s that was the first high school based um, group working for change. And now many middle schools have these clubs as well. Some elementary schools have these clubs. And they're making a really big difference in many communities um, and taking on all kinds of issues. I'm going to tell you a couple more GSA stories. This is a group of teens from Inuvik. And they started a G they had to have a GSA in their school, Aurora GSA, and they started their community's first pride celebration. There hadn't been a pride parade in their community, and they thought that there should be. And so they talked to other people in their community, um, teachers, the doctors and nurses at the hospital, got lots of support from the community, and organized a pride parade. And as you can see, they are dressed rather more warmly than people at Toronto Pride or Pride in New York in, in June. And in fact, they had so much snow right before their Pride Parade that they had to walk an extra long route because the snow hadn't been cleared on the route that they had originally planned to walk. They didn't know how many people would show up. But when they got back to the high school at the end of their march, um, they were really happy to see that the high school gym was packed with people. Um, they had a barbecue, they gave away t-shirts, um, and they're hoping to make this an annual event. And here's one of the teachers who supported them, or an adult in the community who supported them. And I wanted to, to mention the role of allies that throughout the history for LGBTQ plus rights and really for any social justice movement, um, allies also play an important role. And by ally, I mean somebody who supports that movement and supports that cause and works for change, even though they're not part of the community most directly affected by it. So for example, you know, my friends who are men and boys, it's, can, I expect them to stand up for gender equality and to stand up for, for women's rights. As somebody who's white, I think that I have a responsibility to fight racism and to try to work towards ending systemic racism. So there's lots of ways where we can take actions as an ally. Um, and one of the cool things about GSAs is, is that they are gender and sexuality alliances that they, they welcome all students. So many of the students who join GSAs aren't part of the LGBTQ plus community themselves, but they just think that everyone should have equal rights and they want their school to be safe and inclusive and they want to um, support people who are coming out um, and want to work for, for equality and for social justice. So allies have always played a really important role as well. This is a group of kids from the Sunshine Coast. When I visited their school uh, a year, a year or two years ago, I guess, now to talk about my Pride book, um, met with this great grade five, six students. Um, they had lots of great questions, lots of energy. A couple months later, I got an email from them um, letting me know that after my talk, they had gone to speak to their principal because they wanted to paint a rainbow crosswalk at their school. And they spoke with the school superintendent, they spoke with the parent advisory council um, and got permission to paint a rainbow crosswalk. They actually worked with the high school in the community as well who held a bake sale to raise money to buy paint to support them. 
uh, and they painted this fabulous rainbow crosswalk and they talked about you know wanting everybody who arrived at their school to know that it was a safe welcoming place um, that stood up for for equality and for social justice so i thought that was an amazing story and i was so impressed that these kids pulled it off and uh, i am looking forward to someday getting to go back to the sunshine coast so i can see it in person the last part of the pride book um, and part that's really important to me is about what pride looks like in different countries around the world. And this is a photo from the first pride celebration in Uganda back in 2012. There are many countries in the world where people who are part of the LGBTQ plus community face discrimination, persecution, violence. Um, and in fact, there's more than 70 countries in the world where being gay is a crime and LGBT people are really not safe. And some of those people end up having to flee their countries. So a refugee may be somebody who's fled war um, or violence, but people can also become a refugee because their human rights aren't, aren't um, recognized or respected in the country they live in. And so for somebody who is gay or lesbian or transgender living in a country where their identity is criminalized, um, they may be very unsafe. And this map, you can see that many, so the darker red and orange colors are, are countries where same-sex relationships are criminalized. So you can see that many countries in Africa and in the Middle East in particular um, are really very unsafe for people who are LGBTQ+. And I wanted to tell you a couple of stories about some refugees um, who I know who, who fled their countries for that reason. So this is a friend of mine, um, Seagirl Abison, in the middle of the picture here in the blue tank top. Um, Seagirl fled her country of Uganda when she was still in her teens and went to Kenya as a refugee, as a refugee because as a transgender person, she was so unsafe. She spent a year and a half in a refugee camp called Kakuma, which is one of the world's largest refugee camps. It actually has a couple of hundred thousand people, so it's huge. Um, and it's, it's a hard place for everyone to live, but for refugees in the LGBTQ plus community, it's particularly dangerous and unsafe. Um, Seagirl Ibison and, and a number of other people organized a pride parade in the refugee camp. And it was the first pride parade to be held in a refugee camp anywhere in the world. Um, so this is a photo from that pride parade. And I will actually just say that, that oh, sorry, um, Seagirl is now living in Canada. Um, she's now 21. She was 19 at, at this time. She's now 21 and she's, she's now living here um, and working really hard to support LGBTQ people who are still refugees. So she's doing a lot of fundraising, a lot of activism um, to try to change people's hearts and minds and to encourage people to be more accepting and also to raise money to send to people in Kakuma refugee camp, um, her um, sort of chosen family, many of whom are still there to buy food, to buy mattresses, um, to pay for medical bills and to do all kinds of um, um, take all kinds of small actions to try to make their lives better while they're waiting and hoping to be resettled in safer countries. Two other refugees who I wrote about in the Pride book are Eka and Rainer. Eka and Rainer are a gay couple from Indonesia and they came to Canada um, and claimed refugee status in Canada. Um, and, and like, like Seagirl Ibison, have, have gone on to do a lot of activism themselves, working with groups like Rainbow Railroad and Rainbow Refugee um, to, to raise awareness, to raise money, to support LGBTQ refugees. In fact, they recently appeared on um, Drag Race Canada in a special episode with uh, Rainbow Railroad, which helps people around the world who are unsafe because of their sexual orientation and, and trying to find safety. Now, Rainer and Eka when they realized that they were becoming unsafe in Indonesia, that they needed to flee their country and come to Canada, um, they had to leave behind you know, their friends, their jobs, um, almost everything. But the one thing that they couldn't bear to leave behind was their cat, Ghost. Ghost was a kitten that they had rescued. Rainer had seen a picture on Facebook of this abandoned kitten that was stuck in a chicken coop across town. And, and he actually went two hours across the city to find this kitten and bring it home. And, um, gave it a bath and it turned out to be a bright white kitten um, and they didn't want to leave it behind. So when they came to Canada, they found a way to bring their cat 
with them. And we decided to work together on this book, Ghost's Journey, A Refugee Story, which tells the story of their um, life in Indonesia, becoming unsafe in Indonesia, their decision to try to come to Canada and starting a new life in Canada. And it tells the story from Ghost's point of view. Um, so although I wrote about Rainer and Eka in my Pride book and, and told that their story, for this book, I had to interview them again to say, so when this was happening, what was your cat doing? So, so when you had to move apartments, how did your cat feel about it? So that we could put together this story um, about their cat. And the artwork in the story is actually all based on Rainer's photographs. Um, he's a, a wonderful photographer. So these are actually all photos of the real, the real ghost who um, now lives in Toronto and just turned seven last week. Um, and I'm just gonna read you the first few pages of this book just to, give you a little sense of it. Ghost lived in a small apartment on the beautiful island of Java with her two dads. When Rainer played video games, Ghost snuggled by the headphones and purred. When Eka cooked gulai, Ghost stood on her back legs and begged for a taste. When friends came over, Ghost played with everyone. But when strangers came to the door, Rainer and Eka turned off the lights and pretended no one was home. Ghost wanted to help. She fetched them toys to play with. She snuggled close and licked their tears. People don't like us, Ghost, Rainer whispered, just because Eka and I love each other. Over and over, they had to move. Ghost did not like moving. She hid behind the curtains and on top of bookshelves where she felt safe. If any of you guys have cats, you know how they like to do that. She hid beneath the bed, inside a paper bag. Over and over, Rainer said, sorry, Ghost, it isn't safe for us here. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm not gonna read you the whole book, but um, it does have a happy ending. And it's a book that we wrote because we wanted to raise awareness um, and also to raise money. So any money that that book makes in sales and in, in royalties is what the author's, author's um, money from making, from selling books is called. Any royalties that that book earns go to support LGBTQ plus refugees. Um, so we're hoping it can raise both awareness and also um, to raise some funds. So the last book I and wanted there was to- a, So the question, Robin, just in terms of where that, where someone could buy those books. Yes. Um, so Ghost's Journey, um, you could order it from your local independent bookstore. You can also order it directly from the publisher. The publisher is Rebel Mountain Press. Um, and if you go to my website, it's just robinstevenson.com and find the page for Ghost's Journey. There should be links there for where you can purchase it. But I will tell you, if you purchase it directly from Rebel Mountain Press, um, they are also trying to um, sh give some of the proceeds from the book to um, LGBTQ plus refugees with organizations like Rainbow Railroad and Rainbow Refugee. So buying directly from the publisher does mean more money goes to refugees. So I do encourage people to do that. But also it's great to support your local independent bookstores. So, you know, you really can't go wrong. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And we have just a couple minutes, Robin. Before. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention this book as well. So Kid Activists, um, it's a collection of pieces about 16 different activists from Martin Luther King Jr. to Nelson Mandela, um, to Autumn Pelche, um, an indigenous teen who's a water protector. Um, and it talks about, it's different than most biographies because it talks about their childhoods. So. You know, I thought I knew a lot about Martin Luther King Jr., for example, but I knew about his adult life and his activism. I didn't know what he was like as a little kid. So it was really interesting to learn about these people's childhoods and who the important role models in their lives were and some of the influences that, that perhaps helped them grow up to become such important activists. Um, and for kids listening, I wanted to also send the message that you don't have to wait until you're an adult to become an activist. So some of the people that I included in this book became activists while they were still children themselves. Um, 
So I just wanted to encourage kids to think about, you know, what are the issues that you really care about in the world? You know, is it, is it racial justice? Is it the environment? Is it climate change? Um, is it animal, animal rights? You know, is it homelessness? Like what are the things that, that you're really passionate about? And how can you find other people who share those passions? And how can you make a difference? And there's so many different ways of making change. I think sometimes when people think about activists, they think about protests and protests are important, but so is letter writing, so is creating art. Um, for me, writing is, is, is how I do my activism, right? It's how I can reach people and try to encourage people to think about um, social justice and, and, and making change. So think about, you know, what are the things that you like to do and, and how can you use those things to make a difference in the world? And Chris had a, a great idea about um, that if, if people wanted, for example, to make a poster or to write a letter that, that you thought perhaps they might be interested in sending to you, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you reflect on this, like what is an activist? How do people make change? And especially what do you care about? And how, how can you, um, whether it's that making a poster or writing a letter, what, what is it that makes how how can you express that that care, um, and then and then send it to us, and we'll we'll share next week um, some of the some of the ways that people are expressing their the way that they're they feel passionate about um, things in their life, and then and I'm thinking Robin just showing the the kids jumping up on in sun on the Sunshine Coast, and the GSAs just the the importance of finding community through that. Uh, that activism and and doing doing that kind of work together um, lifts people's spirits, but it also realizes you know people realize that you're not alone. And absolutely, there's you know I actually when I was writing the kid activists book, one of the people who I found really inspiring was was Autumn Pelchain because she was so young. You know she began um, her work as a as an activist in her community when she was only eight. You know she was speaking to the United Nations last year when when Greta Thunberg was there or Autumn was as well. And I actually ended the book with her words, um, because she really does want other young people to join her. And she said. Anybody could do this work. If we all come together, we can hopefully make a big change. And I think that piece about coming together is really important because when, you know, some of these problems are really big and if you're just sort of looking at them, it can feel really overwhelming. But when you actually find other people who are passionate about those same things and start talking to those people and realizing that, you know, many, many, many people um, are working on these issues and wanting to make change. And um, when you can be many and you can be organized, um, you know, you, you do have a lot more power. And once you start taking action, that in itself, I think, can make you feel more hopeful and can make these problems feel more solvable. And reading about the history, whether it's LGBTQ rights in the Pride book or, you know, civil rights um, and some of the stories from the Kid Activists book and seeing how far we actually have come and how much change people have made. You know, the, yes, there's big problems now that people need to work on, but there's been really big problems in the past and people have fought for um, civil rights, for the right for women to vote. You know, all of these things changed because people fought for them. And um, often young people were a big, big part of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I, I was gonna say, that's a great place to end and we, <laughs> we can end there. Um, I also was thinking one thing just in, uh, in terms of um, so something that happened last night because my kid is a uh, trans youth, a uh, 15 year old trans youth and, and they, came, they like, came out of their room jumping up and down because they were um, watching a film or a TV series where there was a trans character and but played by a trans actor yeah. and and a really like cool person too yeah. so um that so that kind of representation and being able to see your story in a positive and like um a fulsome light is just is really powerful so the the right being the writer and putting stories forward especially in collaboration with with others, I think is um, is really important. So um, I just I'm sure that there's lots of of your readers that have felt that same kind of like, yay, like finally, like m my story is is being is being told.
Yeah. And I would encourage them all to write their stories as well. Yeah, because we, totally. do, we need more of those stories and we need the, and their voices need to be heard. So um, yeah, if you're out there and you're thinking about writing. Totally. <laughs> so I'll end with one note just from, um, from Facebook. Michelle uh, writes, grateful for this fabulous guest from our community and the fantastic influence she has through books, talks, supports for refugees, and even her street side library. So. So on that note, thank you so much, Robin. Thank you. It was thank so you. great to have you here. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we just stopped the Facebook.